This morning, as Pastor Ben said, I'm continuing our Each One Reach One series. And I want to talk to you about being a spirit-empowered witness. Now, before I moved to Calgary, I was working in a home that cared for kids right after they got taken from their homes by social services. So we would look after them until they had a more permanent home to go to, whether it was foster or a care home or some, yeah, just youth home. We looked after them. And every single morning that I woke up, I would say, Holy Spirit, come and fill me and open up opportunities to share the good news with my coworkers and with the children that we care for. So I tried to have a real missional posture in this job that I had. And as time went on, I had the opportunity to share the gospel with all of my workers, all of the children that we cared for. And as I began to pray, the Lord began to do real unique things in this secular job. My coworkers and children began to have encounters with the Holy Spirit. I would engage them in gospel conversations. They would open up about things happening in their lives, pain in their bodies. I would ask if I could pray. They'd experience healing. Then they're like, what the heck just happened? I'd get to share the good news of Jesus with them. And one particular girl was a Muslim. And so the cool thing about what was happening in our organization, again, remember, secular organization, was that because the kids were having such profound encounters with God, they all wanted to start going to church. And so every Sunday morning, the whole front row and a few sections back was all full of children that were going to church. And because the children went to church, the adults had to go to church. And so there was Muslims and Sikhs and Hindus and Buddhists and atheists and all the this that came and were gathered. And they were focusing just at getting through the service. But the Lord was meanwhile doing such a profound work in their hearts. And one Sunday morning, I looked back at a friend that I had in that job who was a Muslim. And as I looked back at her, I heard the Lord say something to my heart. And he said, the teachings of the, Moh- uh, the Muhammad, the teachings of the Quran and Muhammad have left her empty. Tell her I am the only way to the life that she seeks. And my heart began to pound. I would love to tell you that I was ready and I went in guns blazing, but I was scared out of my mind of being that direct with her. So I just laid my hands on my heart and I said, dear God, help me. Fill me with your spirit. Give me courage. Come Holy Spirit. And I turned to her after worship and I said, hey, is it okay if we talk in the foyer? And she's like, yeah, sure. So we went outside and we talked and we had a really great conversation where I got to share the good news of Jesus with her. And at the end of that conversation, I really challenged her in telling her that Jesus was the only way to eternal life. And it was not Muhammad. It was not the teachings of the Quran. Jesus is the only God who has come for her and to save her. So I said, if what I'm saying is true, is it okay if I just pray for you and ask that Jesus himself will reveal this to you? She was like, sure. So I prayed a very simple prayer over her. And I said, Jesus, man in white, would you reveal yourself to your daughter and show her that you are the way, the truth, and the life? About a month went by. I hadn't seen her as she worked night shift. I worked day shift. And we happened to be in the same room as we were exchanging shifts. And she came up to me and she said, oh my goodness, I've been looking for you. How do I become a Christian? I don't want to be a Muslim anymore. I, 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 yeah, I was in shock. I said, okay, let's talk some more, but not right now because I'm about to go into my shift. So we went out for coffee with a friend of mine uh, to good old Tim Hortons. We met there in the middle of Timmy's. And she begins to share with her, share with me that these words kept playing in her mind. She couldn't get them out of her mind. Jesus is the only way, the truth. Like She just kept playing this over and over and over again. She said, so I picked up a Bible, I began to read it, and one night I had a dream. She says, in my dream, this man glowing, dressed in white, stretched forth his hand to me and said, I am Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Come and follow me. She said, as soon as she woke up, I knew Jesus was who I was supposed to follow. So I said, do you know who the Holy Spirit is? She said, no. What's a Holy Spirit? Fair question to ask. So I explained to her the gift of the Holy Spirit. She said, I want to receive this. We laid hands on her. And right there in the middle of Tim Hortons, she begins to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enables her. 
Church, apologetics are great. And knowing how to give a good defense for your faith is incredible. That's a high thing to do. And we should all be able to do that. And having good communication skills is great as well. But all of that means nothing unless you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because it is not apologetics that Jesus came to teach so that we could be a good effective witness. It was receiving the infilling of the Holy Spirit to have the power to live our lives on mission for Jesus and impact our spheres of influence. You ready? Strapped in? Put out your hands like this as you're receiving a gift. Any of you like gifts? Just because it's not Christmas doesn't mean you don't get a gift today. I want you to repeat this short, simple prayer with me. Ancient but profound. Come Holy Spirit. Let's just wait on him this morning. You are the good gift giver, Jesus. There are many gifts in the Bible, but only one is called the gift of the Father, and that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. So for your sons and daughters who are in person or joining us online, Come, Holy Spirit, fill us with your presence, and may you be glorified this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Although many would start a message like this in Acts chapter 2, and I'm sure many of you have been parts of messages like this that start in Acts chapter 2, we will not. We will get there, but in order for you to understand why Acts chapter 2 is so important, you need to understand what took place before. And so our journey of understanding God's heart for the world and for mission begins in Genesis 1, 28, which reads, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. In Genesis, God knits creation through the sound of his voice. He creates the cosmos and the first humans in six days, resting and dwelling with his creation on the seventh. He designs this beautiful garden space where heaven and earth overlap, they become one, and this was a space where humanity was to experience life overflowing with God's abundant, personal, and intimate presence. Adam and Eve are commissioned as priests before God to take care of this sacred space and ensure that nothing would enter that would defile it. And they were also given a commandment, be fruitful and multiply. All of you are here because your parents were faithful to that commandment, to be fruitful and multiply. Only James is excited about that one. (laughs) Because it would be through Adam and Eve, the first bearers of God's image, and the carriers of his glory, that the entire earth would be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. However, if you've read the story, you know that it doesn't have a happy development. Instead of caring and protecting this sacred space, Adam and Eve are lured into a power grab to rebel against God and to find good and evil on their own terms. So because of their rebellion, God banishes them from his residence. But before banishing them, in Genesis 3.15, God gives a prophetic word saying that one day an offspring would come from the woman who would crush the head of the serpent, and that serpent would strike the heel of that offspring. And then in Genesis 3.21, God performs the first animal sacrifice covering over the nakedness that brought Adam and Eve shame. And so Genesis 3 wraps up with a prophetic word, a declaration from God that redemption is coming, and then a prophetic sign that this restoration that will come will cover over the shame of the guilty. But God does not stop there with announcing his heart to restore humanity back to himself. When you flip over a few pages to Genesis 5, you discover a lengthy list of names that if we're honest here, uh, it's often boring and hard to read. Maybe that's just me and you guys are a lot more spiritual than me, but these are hard names to read and sometimes boring. But on the screen behind me, you'll see these names and the meanings of the names beside them. So what happens when you put all of these together? They preach the gospel. What is the gospel? Man is appointed mortal sorrow, 
But the blessing God shall come down, teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. Later in Genesis 12, God appears to Abraham and makes with him a covenant, an agreement that cannot be broken. Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3 reads, And the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. In this moment, Abraham receives the Eden blessing, the blessing to be fruitful and multiply. But this blessing would not just be for the forefather Abraham, but for the entire nation of Israel. She receives the calling to be a blessing to all nations of the world. She becomes a covenant nation charged with the responsibility to represent God amongst the nations of the world. Through her faithfulness and her obedience, the world would know the true living God, Yahweh. And from this point forward, you will see that God descends on specific people for specific purposes to accomplish what was humanly impossible on their own. Just think of Moses or Joseph or Gideon in the army or King David versus Goliath or King Solomon in the establishment of the temple. Time and time again, God pours out his Holy Spirit on a specific person and through their leadership, the nation of Israel is able to be a witness to the nations of the world. However, more often than not, Israel failed. And if you continue reading through her Old Testament, you will know that instead of being a faithful covenant-keeping people, she rebelled and disobeyed God as she did in Genesis. And she chose to follow false gods and define good and evil on her own terms. However, later Isaiah's prophets longed for the day when God would come, renew the heart of his people, and pour out his spirit upon them. The day when God would become one with humanity, where heaven and earth would overlap and the Garden of Eden would be reinstated, not for just a select few, but for all who would call upon his name. The prophet Ezekiel writes in chapter 36, verses 26 to 27, saying, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Later in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 to 29, Joel prophesies of the coming day and says, And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. These verses and so many more show the day that the prophets longed for. Now before we move into the New Testament, I want to read to you from Isaiah 52, verse 7. And I want to give you a little bit of context to understand what's going on in this piece of scripture. The city of Jerusalem was supposed to be the place where God would rule and reign and bring peace to the nations of the world. But because of Israel's disobedience, the city of Jerusalem and her temple were destroyed. And the prophet Isaiah was saying, hey, this is a mess in your own making. You made this happen. This is a result of your disobedience and your lack of faithfulness. So naturally speaking, the people of God that were in Jerusalem or exiled were left wondering, what has happened? Has God abandoned us? Will there be any breakthrough or any way forward? And so Isaiah 52 verse 7 is a poem where there is a watchman on a, on a city wall who's looking down and he sees someone that's running towards him yelling good news. Isaiah 52 verse 7 reads, How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, and who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, 
your God reigns. These feet become beautiful because they carry a beautiful message. The message that despite Jerusalem's destruction and the people's rebellion, God's, Israel's God still reigns as king. And he will one day return to the city, take up his throne, and bring peace to the nations. So good news, sometimes translated as the word gospel, is the Hebrew word baser, meaning to bring good news, bear tidings, publish, or preach. And in Israel's scripture, this phrase is always the announcement of a new king or a victorious reign. For example, in 2 Samuel 18, verse 31, the Cushite came to King David and said, My Lord the King, hear the baser, or the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all those who rise up against you. In this case, King David's army was victorious in battle, meaning that he still ruled on the throne and as a consequence over the people of Israel This was good news for them. And in the New Testament, the phrase good news becomes euangelion. In Greco-Roman context, to evangelize meant to bring good news about a great event such as a victory in war, as seen in the Old Testament, or a declaration that a son had been born to an emperor. And so with that in mind, let's turn to Mark 1, 14 to 15. It reads... And after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news, the euangelion of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And as you read through the gospels, you'll see that Jesus brought a new way of life. He taught the people to put down their sword and seek peace through radical generosity, even towards your enemies. He challenged the people with teachings like, if you want to become great, you must become least of all. He instructed his followers to respond with love, even when great sin had been committed against them. Jesus came to show the path of human flourishing. He went around healing the sick, setting the captives free, forgiving sin, restoring life, calling people to repent from their ways, from defining good and evil on their own terms, and instead walk in the way of everlasting life. And so Jesus continues Isaiah's gospel, announcing the euangelion of God's kingdom. Jesus claimed that God was restoring his reign over the people of Israel, the nations of the world, and that he was the one bringing it all about. And at the end of his life, Jesus is enthroned as king over this new kingdom by receiving a crown of thorns on his head, a robe on his flesh torn back. And instead of being lifted up on a throne, he is lifted up on a cross where his heel is pierced as prophesied, and he becomes the sacrifice that covers over the shame and the guilt of those with sin. So instead of rising up as a powerful political leader to destroy Rome and liberate the land from its oppressors, Jesus lays down his life and three days later rises from the dead. His death brings the despairing rest through his resurrection. And in his resurrection, Jesus conquers and crushes the head of Satan. He would once again be enthroned king over the entire world and have full dominions and governance because he conquered sin, death, and the grave. This is good news, church. Therefore, according to Isaiah and Jesus, The good news is this, that Jesus is the Christ. He is the anointed king, savior, son of God, who came to earth in flesh and blood. He established a new kingdom, teaching what it meant to be fully alive. And his death made way for humanity to be recreated and receive a new heart. Again, how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of those who bring the good news. 
Therefore, the church, or sorry, the gospel is not a message of, here's how you get out of hell, pray this prayer real quick with me. Instead, in the words of theologian N.T. Wright, the gospel is not, a, is not a message about something that might happen to us. It is a new reality born through Jesus, energized by his spirit, catching us up within it. We are to be gospel people, people who in ourselves and in what we say are signs of the good news that the living God is reclaiming, redeeming, and transforming his creation at last. We are a redeemed people called to establish a heavenly kingdom on earth. Church, we are not waiting for death to get us to heaven. If that is what you're waiting for, then you have more faith in death than in the cross of Jesus Christ. We need all of heaven to get inside of us. Because Jesus did not die to get you to heaven. He died to establish a kingdom through you on earth as it is in heaven. And when we walk as we did in the garden, the space where heaven and earth overlap, We become living announcements that God reigns. We become living invitations for people to experience life, healing, and restoration. This is living as a gospel-centered people, a gospel-centered church. One that doesn't go selling salvation as a sales pitch, but instead embodies the realities of the risen Savior made possible through the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And so here's where you and I come in as an extension of Israel's calling to bear witness of this good news. After raising from the dead, Jesus is recorded in Acts 1, 8 saying, but you will receive power. Everyone say power. Power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What does this sound like to you? the reinstatement of the commission of Eden to multiply and to be the one who would cause the world to know the way to Yahweh. You see, when you read through the Gospels, you actually realize that at the end of every Gospel, Jesus reinstates this Eden commission. At the end of Matthew, he says, make disciples of all nations. At the end of Mark, he says, preach the gospel to all creation. At the end of Luke, he says, wait until you receive power so you can be my witness. And at the end of John, Jesus says, as the Father sent me, now I send you. And I believe that now I send you is a prophetic word for us this morning. That as we saw our Savior walk, now he sends you and I to be an extension proclaiming the euangelion of God. Now many have coined this term the Great Commission, and rightly so. Because he brought the good news of the kingdom, he now sends us to continue announcing that kingdom. But I want to challenge you with something this morning, okay? This is called the Great Commission and not the Great Suggestion. And I propose that there are a lot of people in the Western church that are approaching the scriptures as if this was a kind gesture. If you would so please, would you please share the kingdom of the gospel with your neighbor? If you feel comfortable, would you please share the good news of Jesus? Church, it doesn't matter your comfortability level or your fears or your insecurities or your knowledge or your lack of knowledge. If you and I want to be faithful to follow the way of Jesus, we must partner with his biggest heart for all of humanity. Now, I know that sharing your faith in this cultural moment may not be comfortable or popular, but Jesus gave us the ability to do this through the Holy Spirit. Not through how well you can communicate or not, through how well you know your scriptures or don't, through apologetic abilities or your ability to maneuver in conversations, but simply through the power of the Holy Spirit working within you. So after raising from the dead, Jesus told his disciples to wait until they received this power. Why? Because when they received, they would have everything they need. Did you notice that the disciples didn't go through an evangelism class? (laughs) It's important, okay? I'm not saying none of this stuff doesn't matter or that we don't talk about this, but all they had was the Holy Spirit and that's all they needed and they turned this world upside down. And so 50 days after Jesus raises from the dead, his disciples 
find themselves in an upper room, scared out of their minds because of the persecution of the religious leaders that were after them because of the claims that Jesus had risen from the dead. And so Acts 2, 1 to 4 says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit as, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And as the chapter carries on, you'll learn that there were Jews from many nations gathered in this space. They heard the disciples declaring the wonders of God in their own language. And what happens as a result of this experience? The apostle Peter, who had previously denied Jesus out of fear, stands up in front of thousands and proclaims the kingdom of God. And he says, this moment is a fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all people. Now, I want to draw you to the Old Testament imagery that the writer Luke includes. When Luke tells the reader that violent wind came from heaven and tongues of fire came and separated on each individual gathered, he's actually making a connection to the very presence of God that was closely associated with fire. Luke wants to remind you of the time when fire came down at the commemoration of Solomon's temple. He wants you to think of God appearing to Moses in the burning bush or on Mount Sinai or the visions of Ezekiel and Daniel who see God appearing in the form of fire. These believers in the upper room who had given their allegiance to Jesus had their spirits made alive through the Holy Spirit, cleansed from their sin, could now have the power and presence of God signified by fire rest upon them. God's dwelling place would not be in a building as it was in the temple, but in the hearts of humanity as desired from the beginning they would become a new Eden space, the space where heaven and earth overlap, they become one, and now we become the opportunities for others to experience the living God. The Spirit is poured out, renews their heart, and they are once again, as in the beginning, sent out, scattered around the world to proclaim the euangelion of God's kingdom. Now, each one of us here who has given our allegiance over to Jesus has been called to fulfill this commission in our spheres of influence. However, this mandate is not possible unless we receive what Jesus said to the disciples to wait for. Pastor Bill Johnson from Bethel Church says, We have been given the privilege to host the presence. The Holy Spirit is in me for my sake, but he is upon me for yours. Each of you here who has made a public and personal confession that Jesus is Lord over your life has the Holy Spirit living in you. But that does not mean that you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. If you remember in John 3, uh, Nicodemus goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, how can I have the way to eternal life? Or I can't remember exactly the words. And Jesus says, you must be born again. Not of natural means, but of means by the Spirit. Because in our sin, our spirits are dead. But when we place our faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the finished work of the cross, what happens in that moment? The Holy Spirit comes and he takes residence within me. So the disciples experienced this, but they still had to wait to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Think about it like this for a moment. You invite me over to your house for a meal, which if you want to, I gladly accept. (laughs) I knock on the door, and I hear you say, come in. And so I come in, and as I'm walking in, you say, just take a seat in the living room. I'll be right there, just finishing up some final preparations. And I say, okay, I take a seat in the living room. In that moment, you have welcomed me into your home. But until I encounter you, I have not been fully welcomed by you. And so for those of you who have said yes to Jesus, you have welcomed the Holy Spirit. But until you encounter him and be baptized in his presence, you have not been fully filled with the Holy Spirit. We, church, have been saved from our sin, are now able to continue this ministry of Jesus on earth. We are restored to restore. 
And it is not in buildings or programs that will fulfill the heart of God who desires all humanity to be saved, as 1 Timothy 2.4 says, but a people who will be the hands and the feet of Jesus turn on the light and expel the darkness. It is through a praying church that is more comfortable, that is more concerned with the lost, hurting, and broken of their city than their comfortability. It is through a bold and courageous church that will live their everyday lives, going to work, taking the kids to school, grocery shopping, and stop and ask, Holy Spirit, how are you at work in my midst? It is through a church that embodies the character and the practices of Jesus, of radical hospitality and generosity, that when outsiders look in, they can't help to be compelled by your love and your sacrifice. It is through an empowered and bold church that will scatter throughout the city of Calgary to bring the euangelion of God's kingdom becoming a thriving river and not an accumulating lake that is ineffective. Church, this is not wishful thinking. This is New Testament supernatural living. It is for this reason that when the disciples met new believers, they didn't ask, hey, what church do you go to? Or what do you believe? Or what's your doctrine on this? Or do you believe in the rapture? They didn't ask any of these things. Acts 19 too, what did the disciples ask when they meet new believers? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you first believed? Go through Acts and every time the disciples meet new believers, this is their question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you first believed? Because the disciples knew that it wouldn't just be through 12 that would accomplish seeing the whole world come to know God. It would be through every single believer filled with power and presence that would go out with boldness and courage and see the lost saved, healed, and delivered. Last week after the service, I went with some of our uh, TYMS gang to Chinook Mall to share the love of Jesus with those that we met. And one of my students and I felt led to pray for a specific man, and classically, I start getting nervous, I start getting scared. Uh, I've done this a thousand million times, and it never goes away. Um, I always have to rely on the boldness of the Holy Spirit. And so we approach him and kindly ask, hey, super random, is it okay if we pray for you? And he was like, no. I said, okay. Um, And he said, but you know what, it's really weird that you would ask that question. And that led us into an hour-long conversation where we got to ask him many questions, not to trap him or prove him wrong, but to see where he was at, to love him, and to discern how God was already at work in his life, because I knew God was already working within him. We had the opportunity of sharing how Jesus has so transformed our lives. We were witnesses, that's all we've done, right? That's all God calls us to be. When you step into court, if you've ever done that, they ask you to bear witness, they're not telling you to give you the facts, They're just saying, hey, tell me what you saw. Tell me what you experienced. That's what we did with this man. Here's what I've seen Jesus do. And here's what I know to be true. And here's what I think he can do in your life if you open up your heart to him and receive what he has. Throughout the conversation, uh, as we came to an end, he randomly said, hey, you know what's really weird? He said, this keeps happening to me. And so my student received what I believe a word of wisdom from the Holy Spirit. And he said, why do you think that is? And he stood there and he pondered. He said, I don't know. It's weird. And I said, no, it's not weird. It's the God of the universe that is chasing your heart. And when is the day when you will say yes to him? And we ended off our time together laying hands on him and praying for him, something that an hour earlier he was opposed by. And as he left, he said, you know what? You guys care. You listened to me share. You didn't fight. You weren't trying to prove your point, but you genuinely cared for my heart. We exchanged numbers. I told him I'd follow up with information on Alpha, and I have. And I'm praying and believing that he'll show up here with many of you as you bring your friends, your neighbors, and your coworkers. <laughs> Pastor and author Dale Johnson says, evangelism is joining a conversation that the Holy Spirit is already having with another person. You see, God is working in people's hearts, church. 
You gotta have more faith that God is already doing a lot of work and all he's asking for you is to just be a faithful witness, to continue planting the seeds or partnering with him and watering the seeds, but he will be faithful to make it grow. He is the one who's responsible for the heavy lifting, not you. All you and I get to do is love people where they're at, let the Holy Spirit convict and convince, and he will take care of the rest. You and I just join conversations that the God of the universe is already having with people as he was having with this individual man. So I want to ask us a question as we conclude. How is the Holy Spirit at work in your sphere of influence? And if you don't know, would you go home and ask him that question? Actually, as a matter of fact, I just want us to close our eyes for a quick minute. And I want you to say this with me. Say, Holy Spirit, how are you at work in my sphere of influence? And I just invite you to allow him to bring faces to your mind or names to your heart. May your heart break for what breaks his this morning. Oh, Jesus, that you would impart a heart for the lost within us. Oh, Jesus, that we would walk in the courage of the Holy Spirit despite our fears or insecurities or inadequacies. Jesus, we lift up these sons and these daughters to you. On the eve today of Ramadan, we pray for your daughters and your sons that are Muslim, Lord. And we pray for the man in white to appear to them and to bring the good news of God that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Holy Spirit, I pray right now in this moment for those gathered in this space and for those online to receive power and boldness, courage to go into their spheres of influence and announce the euangelion of God's kingdom. One more time in the words of N.T. Wright. The gospel is not a message about something that might happen to us. It is a new reality born through Jesus, energized through his spirit, catching us up within it. We are to be gospel people. People who in ourselves and in what we say are signs of good news that the living God is reclaiming, redeeming, and transforming his creation at last. Church, may your heart break this morning for what breaks his. May you join me in getting out of your comfort zone, getting uncomfortable, and going forth and proclaiming the gospel of our risen Lord. Would you stand with me this morning?